We're now about seven days away from safely launching Jared, Kid, Sarah, and Anna to space. We're less than a week away from Polaris Dawn finally launching. The crew had a discussion a week ahead of the trip, led by William Gerstenmeyer, who was a longtime NASA veteran until joining SpaceX a few years ago. Now keep in mind, the Polaris Dawn mission is a stepping stone for going to Mars. This mission will help to develop necessary technology to go to Mars and the moon. From their suits to laser-based communications, the mission will teach us a lot. It's also unique because it includes includes two SpaceX employees, Anna and Sarah. You each have individually contributed to the development of the SpaceX human spaceflight program, especially the Dragon capsule, and provided invaluable experience of training and supporting crews have really contributed in a big way to this mission. But what's really special is the knowledge that they're going to gain from this mission they can then bring back to SpaceX and share with the rest of the SpaceX team. SpaceX representative William Gerstenmeyer also shared SpaceX learned of a new EVA suit problem and solved it ahead of the flight. When we're in the vacuum with 100% oxygen into the spacesuits, we want to eliminate as many flammability risks as possible. It turns out we discovered that in the dry environment there can be static electric discharge and that could potentially lead to a flammability concern. The teams went in to mitigate that. They've changed procedures, they've changed processes, they've added conductive material, and we are truly ready to go fly. This is an example of one of the many things that we learned on this flight that really haven't been exposed before in EVA suit development. So SpaceX and the teams and the crew, with their help, are continuing to push the envelope of what it takes to go to the moon and Mars. Next to speak was Jared Isaacman. He's already been to space after he self-funded the Inspiration4 trip. It's been two and a half years since, uh, since we announced the uh, uh, Polaris, Polaris program and, and Polaris Dawn. It's been a really exciting journey of, uh, of development and training. Just thought it would be good to refresh you all on, uh, on what the Polaris program is all about. So it's a joint program with SpaceX, as, as Gers talked about. The idea is to, you know, develop, test uh, new technology and operations in furtherance of, um, of SpaceX's uh, bold vision uh, to enable humankind to journey among, among the stars. Now, uh, our first mission, which is, is kind of why we're all here today, um, we are about a week away from our, our first um, launch opportunity, which is, which is Polaris Dawn. The second mission will build off of what we learn from the first. And then the third mission will be the first crewed flight of Starship. I think a lot of you are already familiar with it. That's that incredible vehicle, fully reusable launch vehicle that's being built in Starbase, Texas. Um, have twice the thrust of the Saturn V. Uh, it could very well be the 737 for human space flight someday, but it'll, it'll certainly be the vehicle that will return humans to the moon uh, and then on to, to Mars and beyond. So yes, Jared has booked the first human space flight on Starship, in case you were wondering. Leave a quick comment letting me know when you think the first human-rated Starship flight will take place. Okay, now let's learn more about the crew. I'm Jared Isaacman, and I am uh, really, really excited to meet, introduce you to uh, some of my closest friends uh, and crewmates. We spent, uh, you know, the last two and a half years together really becoming a, a family as we got ready for, uh, for this mission. Kid Poteet, he is our uh, mission pilot, so he's an Air Force F-16 uh, background. He is an uh, aggressor commander, uh, a weapons officer, a famed Thunderbird combat pilot, and, uh, and he's been, uh, he's been he was supporting Inspiration4 as one of our mission directors um, you know, prior to, to now. And then uh, we have uh, Anna Menon. Uh, she is our mission, uh, uh, special, mission specialist and uh, medical officer for Polaris Dawn. So she is a SpaceX engineer. Uh, she's a mission director at SpaceX, so she runs mission control when she's not going to space herself. Uh, prior to that, she was a biomedical engineer and supporting astronauts on console at NASA. And we have Sarah Gillis. She's also a mission specialist. She is a SpaceX engineer. Uh, she is a lead astronaut trainer. She's trained many of the crews, uh, the NASA crews that have gone to space, including my previous instructor on, uh, on Inspiration4. She also works in mission control as a core or like a Capcom familiar and she's a very talented musician as well. So next week, Monday, August 26, if all goes according to plan, 434 miles above Earth, this crew will attempt the first ever private spacewalk. 
They'll also be the first crew to test Starlink in space, and they'll be riding in a SpaceX Dragon capsule with the next-generation SpaceX design EVA suits. Elon Musk also pointed out on X that this will be the furthest distance from Earth of a crewed spacecraft in over half a century. Only Apollo was higher. Also, this mission will definitely prove that rockets can be reusable. This will be the fourth flight of a flight-proven Falcon 9 booster, and Jared has already flown in this Dragon. Uh, I think we're flying on uh, booster 1083, which will be its its fourth flight. Uh, We'll be flying on uh, Dragon 207. Uh, on its third flight. This is, uh, if you know the history of it, this is what Crew-1 uh, went to space on. This is what uh, I flew on previously for Inspiration4, and now Polaris Dawn will go on, which is pretty cool. Very low time dragon. Well, if you are planning to watch the launch like I am, just know that it is not at the most ideal time. It's targeted for 3.38 a.m. Eastern Time with a four-hour launch window. That'll be on August 26, Monday, and this launch will be up to five days if they don't end up launching on Monday the 26th. There are also two additional launch times if needed. By the way, as Jared points out here, they do have a reason for launching in the middle of the night. You know, when you uh, when you go uh, higher into into space, there comes with all sorts of potential challenges. You're putting a lot of energy into a vehicle, then you take it out. But there's other other realities when you're up there too, which is a completely different micrometeorite orbital debris environment, uh, obviously a different radiation environment. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, But Earth does a really good job as objects get closer to it to clean them up and burn them up. But that takes a really long time when it's higher up. So a lot of smart people at SpaceX figured out the optimal times for us to launch, which is why we have that launch window. uh, And through um, uh, uh, vehicle pointing, so the attitude we're flying at, and then that low 190 perigee, we're able to uh, mitigate a lot of that orbital debris risk during those launch windows. Also, since I want this to be a highlight version of the talk, I'm just going to run through the mission objectives. They are aiming for an Earth orbit altitude record, so a 1,400-kilometer apogee above Earth. Now, why why do this, right? Um, as I mentioned before, um, when you go into this environment, you're dealing with totally different realities than, for example, when you would go to the, to the space station. So again, it's a lot of energy going into the vehicle. It's a lot of energy to take out of the vehicle when you come back home. It is a different radiation environment. It is a different micrometeorite orbital debris environment. And we stand to learn quite a bit from that uh, in terms of human health, science, and research. Uh, if we get to uh, Mars someday, we'd love to be able to come back and, and be healthy enough to tell people about it. So I think that's it's worthwhile to get some exposure in that environment. Also, uh, it informs vehicle architecture because, generally speaking, vehicles don't like uh, radiation. So that's why we're going to stay there for the shortest amount of time uh, that's necessary to gather the data we want, and then we'll, we'll come back down. This will also include the first commercial spacewalk utilizing SpaceX design EVA spacesuits. Uh, in this case, we'll, and we'll take you through it a little bit, we are going to vent the vehicle entirely down to vacuum. There is no airlock on Dragon. Uh, that means all four crew members are exposed to the vacuum of space. Two will remain inside the vehicle, and two uh, in sequence will go outside the vehicle. When we are out there, uh, we're going to make use of uh, various mobility aids. Uh, this SpaceX team is engineered, and it'll look like we're doing a little bit of a dance. And what that is, is we're going through a series of test matrix on the suit, and the idea is to learn as much as we possibly can about this suit and get it back to the engineers to inform future uh, suit uh, design evolutions. Um, and, you know, we do that. We're super, we're super proud knowing the massive amount of effort that went into to making these suits, and, and just shortly, um, uh, Sarah is going to take you through what that development process is like. Uh, but it's not lost on us that you know, might be 10 iterations from now and a, a bunch of evolutions of the suit, but that uh, someday someone could be wearing a version of which that, uh, that might be walking on Mars. And uh, it feels, uh, feels like, again, a huge honor to have that opportunity to test it out on this flight. They will also have the first test of laser-based Starlink communications on a human space flight, so a new communication system. Here you can see the Starlink Wi-Fi router inside the spacecraft. Um, and this connects to the laser system that Jared mentioned in the trunk called the plug-in laser. You might think getting internet might be as easy as just flipping that switch, turning on your internet, but it's not. Um, We're talking about a laser sending information to a Starlink satellite that is moving at orbital velocity down to Earth and then back again. Um, So it's been an incredible development effort by the SpaceX team, 
And on a personal note, I've taken um, specific interest in this development effort, and we have a special message that we will share with the world using this technology. And of course, they're going to do science and research experiments with 40 experiments from 20 partner institutions designed to advance both human health on Earth and our understanding of human health in space. We have a number of experiments looking into those eye changes that I mentioned occur for astronauts. One, you can see here, uses this contact lens that we will wear and it measures intraocular pressure for extended periods of time and so we can hope to better understand the mechanisms behind these eye changes. Now as we look into a future where there are hundreds or thousands of people living in space for long durations of time, it is only a matter of time before there is a medical emergency that requires intervention. So we can help prepare for this through experiments like the one you see here. This uses an endoscope or a camera that we will insert through our nose into our airway to gather imagery and look for challenges like inflammation. Now I mentioned before those balance issues that astronauts face when they return to a gravity environment. Here you can see us testing a tool that might help with this. It uses electricity shot between the inner ears to simulate that disorientation and teach more rapid adaptation skills. And then finally, looking into the future, artificial gravity is one thing that could help make all of these issues go away. But it comes at a cost, and that is severe motion sickness. But scientists think that when you go to space, you might be less impacted by that disorientation that comes from spinning required for artificial gravity. So we will test that hypothesis. So I am super excited for this mission. I had the pleasure of interviewing Jared Isaacman. I met him at the X Takeover. I actually interviewed him the day after I interviewed Elon. Funny how that works. And I'm glad I'm starting to see more people tune into this and sort of catch on to the fact that this is happening. I think that this is truly incredible and quite daring what they are going to attempt to do here. So Godspeed to the crew. I will continue to cover this and I do plan on covering it live, although I don't know how many of you will be awake, probably a lot of you actually. So hopefully you can uh, join me for a live stream. The full video, if you want to see the whole talk, is on the Polaris Dawn X or Twitter page. By the way, Mechzilla shirts for Flight 5 are now available in my online store, so I will leave the link in the comments and in the description of this video. This is by far my favorite design with Mechazilla, and of course, we're celebrating, hopefully, seeing a catch of the booster on Flight 5. So if you would like to support the channel and maybe have a really cool shirt to show off, please do so and order one. It really does help me and hopefully you like it. I think they're actually pretty cool.